this kind of interesting pivotal role that uh, that Twitter takes is if you make something trend, you know, you make it true. You people believe it, they see it, they engage with it, they amplify it, and so it's a really directly participatory platform in a way that very few things are. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest this week is Renee DeResta, the research manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory and an expert on tech policy, influence operations, and algorithms. You probably know that on Monday, Twitter's board of directors accepted Elon Musk's $44 billion buyout bid. It remains to be seen if the deal goes through. This is a huge story that touches on more than just the platform itself. It affects the future of media, politics, the tech industry, and more. So I wanted to bring in a real expert. When Elon first made his bid, Renee published a piece in The Atlantic titled, Elon Musk is fighting for attention, not free speech. Her analysis was unique in that she focused not on the merits of Elon's stated vision, but on how he fundamentally misunderstands the debate over free speech, content moderation, and Twitter itself. Here's Renee DeResta. Renee DeResta, welcome to Offline. Thanks for having me. I know that we are uh, currently all drowning in uh, Elon Musk takes. But I wanted to have you on because you spent as much time as anyone researching and writing and speaking about tech policy, media trust, misinformation, and especially algorithms, which are topics that all seem to intersect at this debate about Elon buying Twitter. Uh, I'm curious, what was your initial reaction to the news that, uh, at least as of this recording, uh, the acquisition is moving forward? Um, you know, I was a little bit surprised. It seemed more like uh, I was just going to be kind of like, you know, like a, a shit posting meme type, um, will he, won't he sort of thing. But then to actually commit $44 billion to it uh, was was pretty remarkable to see it go through or possibly go through. We don't even know. I know. know. By the time people are listening to this, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, I want to take through a couple of Elon's complaints about Twitter and maybe you can talk about whether they're A, warranted and B, fixable. Um, and, and the first is this idea that Twitter isn't sufficiently sufficiently committed to free speech, um, which you took on in a recent Atlantic piece where you wrote, what Musk and others portray as a battle over free speech is a proxy fight over who is entitled to attention. Can you talk about what you mean by that? Yeah. So uh, first of all, I want to be really clear. I think free speech is foundational to American democracy. I, I don't think that the idea of free speech is in any way something that we should be fighting about in the way that we are. We've kind of turned it into a meme, and that's the thing that I was reacting to a little bit in that essay, right? I want to, for the sake of conversation, I want to hold aside completely the legalistic arguments about it doesn't apply to private platforms. I want to really get at the spirit of what people are asking for and what people feel. And right now, there are a lot of people who feel that they are censored in some way on Twitter. Um, We can talk about why they feel that way and the sort of uh, policy changes and um, the actual research that, that gets into whether or not that's accurate or inaccurate. Um, but pe- what people are saying is they want Twitter to be a platform where they can express themselves. And right now that is coded in very partisan, uh, a very partisan perception, right? The left hates free speech, the right wants absolute free speech and wants, you know, Nazis shouting on every platform, right? And so there is this um, almost kind of like a caricature of the respective positions of each side that is not necessarily rooted in any real reality. But Twitter, ironically, really lends itself to that, right? Twitter is a place, I called it an arena, and I I mean that. It's like like for bear baiting, you know? It's like for factional fighting. That's that's what it's for. And that's because that's how it's designed. And I really would, at some point, love to talk about the design dynamics that lead to that. But right now, when we talk about free speech, one of the things that, that people have realized over time is that Twitter is remarkably powerful. And that's because it captures people's attention. And one of the things that happens when you capture people's attention, when you develop relationships of trust, when you develop amplification networks, is you can activate crowds of people also. One of the ways in which Twitter really rose to the public consciousness was the way that it uh, intersected with the Arab Spring, right? Literal revolution. This was a tool of power. This was a tool that could take down governments. And as that began to happen, you started to see other major entities recognizing that Twitter was a tool of power. You started to see uh, niche groups trying to use it to make themselves look bigger, to to pretend that they were actually a larger share of the public, um, you know, of, of public sentiment than they actually were. You started to see terrorist organizations come on and use the platform. You started to see foreign governments use the platform as a tool of of infiltration, as a tool of 
disinformation, right? And so what you start to see is the recognition that this is a, a platform that that directs people's attention and keeps them quite riled up, quite activated. And that is a incredibly powerful tool for political actors. And that's one of the things that this conversation, I think, is really about. Well, I mean, you know, Elon has talked about Twitter as, as a de facto public town square, um, which, of course, is a phrase that, that Twitter CEO Dick Costello first used back in 2013. You just mentioned, and, and you said this in the piece as well, that it's more of a gladiatorial arena. What do you think happened along the way? I mean, you, you were also ta- said we could talk about some of the design choices, but like, was it ever possible for a platform like this to be a public square where everyone just goes and exchanges ideas and there's free expression, everything's fine? Or was it always destined to become an arena or was that certain design choices that were made? What, what do you think there? I think I think design is actually really important here. I wrote this this little essay back in 2016. I was reading a bunch of crowd psychology and and um, there's a, a concept of open versus closed crowds. And in an open crowd, you just have groups of people who come together. It's quite spontaneous, right? Um, think about a protest movement or something like that. They come together spontaneously versus uh, a closed crowd, which is the idea more of um, people who participate in, for example, like a church group, a a group function. There's a cohesion there. They see each other regularly. There's like a structure to it as opposed to this like spontaneous uh, activation. And Twitter really began to be this place for that spontaneous activation because what would happen using design is you would come to the platform, you'd open up your phone and yeah, you would see the things that you were following, but there was also this trending feature, right? And you could click into trends and you could see what people who were not in your network, you did not follow, um, but you could see what they were talking about. You could see kind of where was like the public id in that moment. What was the thing that was really captivating people? Sometimes it would be a trend around like sports. You know, there was some big game and everybody was like communing around the game and how great that was. And when the game ended, you know, that trend kind of dissipated. But people also began to realize that you could use those trends for political activation. And one of the things that you could do was turn somebody into what came to be called the main character, right? So you could make a topic or a person or uh, an issue, an article, a meme, you know, whatever it is, you could make it trend. And particularly in 2015, there was a whole gamification process around this. When entities began to realize that having something in that trending feature would generate a crowd around that trend, this was where you started to see the bots come into play, right? The bots were actually a tool to try to make something trend. The bots were not really there to go harass random people. They were there to get enough critical mass tweeting about a particular topic to try to make it trend, to drive the crowd, to drive the the participants to that trend. And so you started to see just through this inadvertent design choice, that didn't happen on Facebook. There was trending stories, but that was really just about like some, you know, some lame article that was popular and Facebook ultimately wound up killing that feature. So this dynamic of Twitter, this, the, the, you know, the arena was really a function of all of a sudden you could activate people around a hashtag and that dynamic, that behavior became so central to what we use the platform today and how we think about it. That's, I hadn't thought about trending topics that way. The the other design function that I thought sort of makes Twitter this arena is, is just the RT, is just, is just retweets. Because there are plenty of times in my own Twitter experience where I'm like, you know what, following this person is making me mad. Why am I following this person? I unfollow the person or I mute the person. But then other people that I like to follow will start retweeting something and suddenly that person I didn't want to follow ends up back in my timeline. And I, But I'm wondering if, and I, and I talked to Ev Williams about this a couple of weeks ago, I'm wondering if just the RT function itself um, is part of the design of Twitter that leads you to start seeing content that you didn't necessarily want to follow on your own and starts sort of driving people towards certain trending topics. It is. and and. Retweeting is one way to make something trend. Um, even holding aside, you know, does it actually clear trending? Per your point, it does get into the to the network that is likely to care about it through the retweet function. Um, there's been a lot written about quote tweeting also and the use of quote tweeting as a tool for dunking, right? As a tool for um, literally pointing your entire follower base at this account by quote tweeting them, particularly if you're going to do it in a way that is uh, hostile, right? I, you know, this is the tool weapon dichotomy, right? A quote tweet 
um, can be really fantastic because you can drive supportive energy towards somebody. You can say, here's a person with a really interesting thought. I love this thread. Go look at it. I do think that there's, um, you know, in this, this tool weapon dichotomy, kind of uh, some function of this is design, but also some function of it is user agency, right? Um, if I want to disagree with somebody and I feel like, you know, intense, like I care enough about it to want to quote tweet. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll screen cap it instead so that there's not like a, a whole mob directed. Um, but I think that, again, there's that question of if you want to direct a mob, you have the power to direct a mob. Right. And that is the you know, that that is, I think, one of the areas where um, the, the kind of tool weapon dichotomy comes into play. And so people who have been on the receiving end of those mobs, I think, have a um, a kind of uh, a real fear that when we talk about making Twitter more free speechy, uh, what we're getting at is um, more of that that kind of behavior, that kind of dynamic. Twitter is a great tool for sharing information, but the harassment angle, the kind of bear baiting uh, aspect of it, is very much core to the platform. Uh, and many people remember, you know, particularly back in 2015 when there was less moderation, how that experience played out for uh, for for many users. I do want to go back to sort of Elon's sort of definition of free speech on the platform and, and the legal aspects only because I think if you are not familiar with Twitter or if you are not, uh, and you're not specifically if you're not familiar with the design of Twitter, you might think it sounds sensible. So he, he said that by free speech, he means that which matches the law and he's against any censorship that goes far beyond the law. Why do you think that's not a sufficient Twitter policy? Well, there's a lot of things that are legal, um, and again, because the, the when we get to the um, the First Amendment in its uh, in its in its legal context, what we're talking about is what can the government um, decide to intervene on, right? And there is a very very high threshold for that, uh, which is what we want to see in a democratic society, right? We want to have that very very high threshold. Where we have the experience on a social platform, though, is this is a community, right? And people are coming together. This is a business also, don't forget, right? And it is not good for business for people to feel that if they take out your app and go tweet something, a horde of <laughs> angry people is going to immediately descend upon them, right? That's not, that's not a good user experience, it turns out. Um, and so there's also an interesting, you know, but again, sticking with uh, kind of free speech, the value, not the, uh, not, not, the um, not, not holding the legal stuff aside. Um, I think you know, there's also a guarantee of freedom of assembly there, right? The idea that uh, the, the purpose of the public square, the purpose of free speech is to express yourself, to make your voice heard. Yes, there is counter speech. Yes, there should be a debate. Um, yes, you know, the antidote to bad ideas is more ideas, better ideas, the marketplace of ideas. But what happens in the experience on the platform, again, coming back to design, is that the a crowd of very, very angry people can push other people out of the virtual town square by using harassment, by using uh, targeted uh, bad speech, if you will. And it, it interferes with the ability of that targeted community potentially to participate in the conversation. So Twitter began to recognize this and to say, okay, that experience A is bad for business, but B is also, you know, using free speech to stifle someone else's free speech by directing a mob of, of hate at them is not in, in, in the trade-off around that value of free speech, that value of pluralistic participation, it's, it's not living up to the value. And you also start to see um, a lot of things that, you know, content moderators are looking at is, I mean, animal cruelty videos, right? It's um, pornography is on there, you know, again, there's, there's, there's so much stuff that falls under the rubric of speech the government would not censor, but speech that does not necessarily lead to the creation of a, uh, a, a healthy community. And I believe that's actually Twitter's term for it now is healthy conversations. How do we think about healthy conversations? Well, and you mentioned some of the stuff that was happening back in 2015 and even before that. One of the examples that I've heard you raise is, I mean, Twitter was being used by ISIS for recruitment. And a lot of what ISIS was doing on Twitter to try to recruit people was technically legal, but certainly dangerous in, 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 in such a way that Twitter decided to take action, right? I think some things get like memory hold in part because social media captures our attention and we pay attention to the shiny thing that is now. And uh, if you haven't been following this conversation or watching these trends for the last seven years, uh, you don't necessarily have that through line. 
what was happening uh, on and on Twitter in 2015, you can actually go back if you you know go to Google search like set the uh, time of, of results returned and pull up the 2014 2015 timeframe, you see an organization growing a virtual caliphate that that's what they call it they call it the virtual caliphate. This was not secret disinformation. This was overt propaganda. The black flag was everywhere. If you followed one jihadi account, it would refer you to other jihadi accounts. Again, inadvertent design, Twitter's own recommendation engines would push people further into that community if they engaged with the content and you know, and participated in that conversation. And so you started to have, you know, there were the kind of actual jihadis, right? But then there was this cluster of amplification fanboys is what, you know, is what the, um, I don't know, colloquial term for it is. And they were the people who would not necessarily declare allegiance and do something that was like an active engagement with a, a, a terrorist organization. But what they would do is they would they would serve as like a kind of boosterism for it. Look how cool this is. Like, look how bold this is. Man, they're really kicking XYZ's ass, the US's ass, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you had the completely, unfortunately, quite lame response of the US government to this, which was to put out counter tweets with hashtags like think again, turn away. Um, but because of US law, they had to be clearly attributed to the State Department, which was uh, the entity that was putting them out. And so they turned into a source of kind of like mass mockery as if the US State Department tweeting at um, people who were, you know, terrorist adjacent or thought this was like a really cool thing was somehow going to dissuade them. And so that itself became kind of a whole, you know, sub um, sub dynamic. And you just you had this network and it was growing. And in the articles about it at the time, you see debates, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. This was soon after the Snowden revelations also. Do we want US government deciding who can and can't speak on Twitter? Do we want Twitter taking takedown notices from US government? And this is a real conversation that was, that was happening in 2015. Um, I was doing some work on it at the time around October 2015. And the tone didn't really change, unfortunately, until the Bataclan attack. Uh, until there was an absolute, literally a massacre in a nightclub in France, and then people started to to wonder, maybe this this vocal support is leading more people to glorify this organization, leading more people to downstream take these actions. We didn't have very good data. It is really hard to connect the dots and say this person saw this tweet and then did this thing and then did this other thing and then got here. So the conversation around online radicalization uh, has always suffered from a lack of, of, of data access and clarity, but that, that perception uh, really began to become the dominant one and you did start to see Twitter uh, taking steps to, um, you know, to minimize the reach of, of that kind of uh, lawful but awful type um, of, of boosterism. The other important point that I saw you make is this idea that we could ever have an unmoderated public square just doesn't really fit with reality, even even off Twitter, right? The idea that there's a public square, that there's just no rules when everyone just gets together and can say whatever they want, right? Like there's always been, you, I think you mentioned the example of noise ordinances or like imagine a, a crowd of angry people following someone around. Like we don't, we don't, we usually don't just let that happen in the in real world either. <laughs> no, and well, this is the, you know, there's, um. The crowd psychology book I was thinking of when I was um, doing the work on the essays uh, by uh, Elias Canetti, it's called uh, Crowds and Power. And, and it's from the 1960s, right? This predates the internet by decades. Um, but it was again, looking at this, this question of how do we think about roles of crowds, formation of crowds and their real world impact, particularly when um, oftentimes there is like a, a momentum towards some sort of violence, right? There's like a desire for some sort of emotional release. What is the thing that they're going to do? Are they going to burn down a building? And what, what is going to happen? And so that that dynamic as it, um, you know, there, there has never been this unmoderated public square. It's a fiction. There's always been a recognition that, you know, behavior in the real world does require crowd control at times and so that question of how and where and is it too stringent does it stifle speech unfairly are protests stifled when there's a you know a legitimate grievance the right of the people to assemble um, but there is this series of, of trade-offs and local ordinances and laws related to how that is conducted you know you do need a like a, a permit to have a protest in New York City and you know, there's just these um, you know there are rules 
Offline is brought to you by Blue Moon. I'm on my uh, third or fourth Blue Moon since the first ad. What about you guys? Wow, good for you. How are you feeling? I'm celebrating responsibly. I mean, I, I, how do you think I'm feeling? I'm almost through the whole orange. I had so many orange slices in here. Yeah, a lot of, you get a lot that it prevents scurvy. People don't talk about that aspect, the scurvy prevention, they, which is important they these don't. days. Yeah, you don't want scurvy. It's lurking out there. Blue Moon is truly one of a kind with its bold flavor, bright explosion of color, iconic orange slice ritual, and authentic roots being born in a ballpark. No I got a long scurvy. Are, it's a real pain in my <laughs> Oh, my God. He's got long scurvy. People, long scurvy. Listen, it's a myth. <laughs> Before I'm gonna just keep Blue Moon is truly one of a kind. No matter who you are or who you're with, it's not long scurvy, Blue Tommy. You're just tired. <laughs> the Blue Moon guarantees a one of a kind beer experience every time. But Blue Moon isn't the only brew that can brighten your life. Try Blue Moon Haze, a hazy, juicy pale ale brewed with dry hazy whole oranges juicy, for a brighter taste. And it's unmistakably the taste is unmistakably Blue Moon. Or check out Blue Moon Light Sky Citrus Wheat and Tropical Wheat, two refreshingly light citrusy wheat beers. Checking in at just 95 calories per 12 ounces. All are perfect for hanging out with friends at home or at the bar. Break away from the same old beer. Blue Moon Belgian White is one of a kind every time. Get Blue Moon Belgian White, Light Sky, and Moon Haze. Delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline to see your delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline. Blue Moon, made brighter. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. Offline is brought to you by Public Goods, the one-stop shop for sustainable, high-quality, everyday essentials made from clean ingredients at an affordable price. Everything from coffee to toilet paper and shampoo to pet food, Public Goods is your new everything store thoughtfully designed for the conscious consumer. Public Goods searches the globe to find clean, healthy, eco-friendly, and innovative products. We love Public Goods. Got their soaps, got their shampoos, got their poop bags, got their cleaning products. Mm -hmm. What else? What am I missing here? I need to re up at Public Goods because I need. Um, I'm a bar soap I guy. Know. I don't. I think you body wash people are cheap and you're fools. Um, and I want some simple bar soaps, and I want a lot of them. It's just like it's like slippery. You're dropping it all the time. I don't know. That's extra time. <laughs> That's extra time. I don't need. Yeah, you know how my showers are five minutes. Five minute showers. That's time you could be. Yeah. You know what? That's funny. That's interesting, Tommy. It's literally the only time he's not on his phone. I didn't, wait, wait. It's I the didn't only you, time. I don't, I don't, I put, and he wants no, to get that time down. Your phone, like on the where you put your your shampoo, just to like scroll. Well, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Love it. Thought I was serious. Love it. I'm thought not I was sure serious. that you are. Hey, knowing what's in your products and where they come from is important. They ethically source and obsessively develop each of their products to be free of unhealthy ingredients and harmful additives still common on drug and grocery store shelves. They're committed to making their products healthy and safe for humans, animals, and the environment. They use a membership model to keep costs low and pass on even more savings to their customers. Best of all, you can make your first purchase with no obligation. We've worked out an awesome deal. Receive $15 off your first public goods order with no minimum purchase. That's right. They are so confident that you will absolutely love their products and come back again and again. They are giving you 15 bucks to spend on your first purchase. You got nothing to lose. Just go to publicgoods.com slash offline or use code offline at checkout. That's P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com forward slash offline to receive $15 off your first order. Offline is brought to you by the new documentary series, Will Be Wild. On January 6th, thousands stormed the U.S. Capitol on Trump's urging. He had tweeted, be there, will be wild. From critically acclaimed podcast studios Pineapple Street and Wondery comes a new documentary series called Will Be Wild. It shines a light on the human stories left out of the January 6th headlines and goes deep into the lives of people who took part in the day, the people who saw it coming, and the people who feared that January 6th was just the beginning. You'll hear from former U.S. intelligence members who warned about the incredible rise of violent extremists in America, a former soldier charged with a seditious conspiracy, and a son who turned his father into the FBI. Will Be Wild is a close-up look at the four-year effort to bring autocracy to America and what the insurrection could mean for the future of our democracy. Follow Will Be Wild wherever you get your podcasts, or you can listen early on Amazon Music or early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. How do you think Twitter has handled the balance between the value of free expression and assembly and content moderation up to this point? Well, I think one of the challenges with content moderation, you know, the um, the policy is only as good as its enforcement, right? And the legitimacy of the enforcement is really tied to transparency around the enforcement. So what you started to see happen, um, the belief that people were being shadow banned, the um, ways in which policies were, you know, appeared to be disproportionately impacting uh, conservative audiences was a, a really big um, kind of 
grievance. One of the ways in which it was happening was some of the policies did not go after viewpoint based content, but went after certain types of behavior. Um, so there are real nuances in Twitter's policy around, for example, you can express um, you know, you can express commentary about a particular group, the trans, uh, you know, kind of trans rights conversation comes up as an example a lot in this lately. Um, you can express a belief or a political opinion or a commentary, but you can't direct hate at a particular person who's a member of that community. And so there is this, um, this delineation, you know, I think um, it says targeted at someone uh, where the primary intent is to harass or intimidate that's written into the policy. So there's this the, the language is broad, the language is often vague, the enforcement is not necessarily uniform. One content moderator may see a particular type of intent and another content moderator doesn't. I think probably most people who've been on the platform long enough and have like reported at least one tweet knows that sometimes things come back and you're like, how the hell did this, you know, <laughs> why wasn't this taken down? Or, you know, you're on the receiving end of something that, uh, you know, where you get a takedown notice that says like, you know, you, um, you, you know, you used a, a, a colloquial phrase that was interpreted by uh, whoever got the content moderation flag as something that, you know, meant more than it was. If you see this in like particular, um, you know, the challenges of moderating particular vernacular at times. Also, one community might use bitch as like a term of endearment and another community sees that as a, you know, um, a, a harassment, right? And so, the AI moderation is not that great. When something goes through a first pass with an AI moderator, you get a lot of false positives. Um, when it goes through a second review by a human moderator, sometimes they'll roll back that decision. So you start to see particularly high profile accounts um, will then publish, you know, what will tweet about their experience with this, uh, you know, somewhat kind of their, their bad experience with the moderation, um, the moderation process. And it, 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 you know, this question of is there disproportionate viewpoint based censorship based on the research that's come out, the answer seems to be no, there has been this was a paper that actually just came out um, <clears throat> last week, I think, um, I think it might have been Brendan Nyhans, I hope I'm not misstating that, but he was tweeting about it at least. Um, in that work, they found that there was, you know, a, a larger percentage of conservative users who were taken down because they were spreading misinformation and so it fell under the misinformation policy. And this is what leads to a lot of questions and debates around like who should be the arbiter of truth and is the moderation policy fairly written and, you know, does the moderation policy um, lead to moderation out sorry does the misinformation policy lead to moderation outcomes that uh, are more significantly impacting one particular group of people so there's just there's so much that goes into it content moderation is really hard and i've been kind of um i don't know if amused is the word but you know i see these tweet storms go by about the you know centuries of jurisprudence on free speech law which is relevant but i don't see anything going by on the you know 20 years of content moderation policy evolution and you know across every single social platform every platform is moderated truth social has a moderation policy parlor has a moderation policy getter has a moderation policy and that's because there is a recognition that this is not that a free for all does not create the best community experience. And so rather than getting at the nuances of we want this, we don't want that, we've just kind of reduced it down to a meme. We want free speech. And that's, uh, you know, and that's where the conversation is. I mean, one of the one of the policies on, for content moderation on Truth Social is that you can't say anything critical about Donald Trump. Is that, <laughs> so, is that in there? <laughs> so much for like the value of free expression. It, it does strike me that <clears throat> Elon himself has not given a lot of thought to content moderation policy. I mean, he did that. Most of what we've heard from him, aside from on Twitter, is in that TED Talk he gave, uh, or that TED Talk interview he gave a couple weeks ago. And I remember he, he was asked, you know, there's one tweet that says, I wish this politician um, were dead, weren't alive anymore. There's another that shows a graphic image of the politician saying, I wish they weren't alive anymore. There's a third tweet that gives the politician's address and says that I wish, you know, what which one do you ban which one do you take down and doesn't this always have to be human judgment at some point there's no algorithm that can figure this out and elon's answer was just just sort of nonsense like he he really hadn't thought about this much at all that this is where you know i've had a lot of um a lot of interesting conversations and also a lot of like um <laughs> like arguments actually with even with people who i think of as as, as good friends um about this it's it's become a weird like it's like 
coded in this weird binary. You either um, love free speech and support this acquisition, or you hate free speech and don't, right? And, and then there's then there's like a, a vast gulf of of potential positions that that exist between those two things. But uh, but this is Twitter, you know. Um, one thing that's been interesting is if you consider the context of moderation in the uh, the Facebook oversight board, right? So this is a really interesting thing. So you have another large platform, different dynamics, much more of the kind of closed crowd group type stuff, but you know, as opposed to the you know the the bear baiting free for all. Um, but the recognizing that sometimes moderation decisions are bad, right? Enforcement was bad. Or more importantly, that a policy doesn't accurately take, doesn't adequately, sorry, take into account um, the value of maximizing free expression. The oversight board does these deliberations and they put out these findings and they're, you know, they're binding for Facebook policy. Um, but they, they put, they do these deep assessments saying, should this person have been taken down over this comment? And they try to have, you know, kind of broader, um, kind of like penumbral, if you will, or, um, you know, what's the precedent? There we go. <laughs> uh, like broader precedent that comes out of these, um, these decisions, these determinations to try to improve the value of free expression on the platform. And so you do see this careful deliberation, the, the uh, findings are put out publicly. They're oftentimes the, on really big pivotal cases, the oversight board members will do some interviews and talk about what their process was. So in a way, it's almost like, you know, the um, Supreme Court kind of, um, of social media moderation. And I do think that there's real value there because maybe with that kind of transparency, here's the facts of the case, here's what happened, here's the moderation decision that was made, here's our finding about whether that moderation decision was uh, good or bad, and here is what the policy could or could not, you know, could or should be instead if the finding is that it was bad or, or um, you know, did not protect freedom of expression. That process and the transparency and visibility of that process, I think, are actually um, quite powerful towards creating a better public understanding and perhaps a better legitimacy in how the public thinks about, um, you know, these these policies and governance on, um, you know, on, on private platforms that are public squares. So, you know, this is not this is not to say that the Facebook Oversight Board is without its faults, but just as a model for helping people understand what is happening and why, I do think that there's actually some real value there, and you know, perhaps. Uh, you know, something more like this on Twitter would help to diffuse um, some of the allegations or refine the policies in such a way as to, you know, for people to, to feel that they're free speech maximizing. Well, on that on that note of transparency, you know, Elon has also talked a lot about making Twitter's algorithm open source. Um, is this feasible? Would it matter? And is there any evidence that doing so would would show that, you know, conservatives have been shadow banned or their views have been suppressed more than liberals or anything like that? You know, first of all, I want to say I am like strongly pro-transparency and algorithmic auditing. And I've been writing about it for years. You know, there's a bill called Platform Accountability and Transparency Act. I, uh, you know, with some colleagues um, literally yesterday <laughs> published some ideas around like, if we ask for transparency, what do we mean? What do we want to get at? What are the questions researchers might want to answer? Um, so much of the perception of what is happening, whether that's anti-conservative bias or you know every group that has had a bad moderation experience feels that there is something stacked against it. Um, is there a way for us to have data access to have an empirical view you know, to, to, to really assess these questions? So I think that transparency is foundational. I cannot get my head around what open sourcing the algorithm actually means in this context. If we're arguing for there should be middleware and users should have greater control over their experience and get to you know, decide what they will or won't see, I think there has been, uh, there has been so many people who are working on that concept of uh, middleware. Um, Ethan Zuckerman comes to mind. He had a, a project called Gobo at MIT that was like, okay, if you were to tweak sliders, what would your feeds show instead? Because there is no neutral in what is shown to you in your feed. This is all about hierarchical ranking in the process of curation. Everything is weighted. When it's short of you know reverse chronological, which is just a different weighting that you know that privileges time. But in every other way, when you open your phone and take it out, it's not that they're trying to suppress or censor you know, your noisy uncle. It's just that they think that some other piece of content is going to be more likely to resonate with you. So this idea, I, you know, I, I used to periodically ask people on Twitter, why do you think 
you're being censored. You know, this was back in 2018 when we could have these conversations. Um, and one thing that people said a lot was, my friends don't see everything I post. And I thought that was such an interesting, you know, such an interesting answer because it just shows a, a complete lack of familiarity. And, and this is not a ding on those people who didn't have the familiarity. This is a failure to communicate of the platform, right? This is how we should be educating people, not just media literacy and sources, but here is how a recommendation engine works conceptually. Here is how a feed ranking works conceptually, just so that you understand a little bit better why your post is not seen by every one of your friends at that time. So this question of open sourcing the algorithm, I think, again, it's being processed as like you either love the idea and you're like pro free speech and pro transparency, or you think the idea is ridiculous, which is where large numbers of people in tech have come down because they're like what they're going to show, like an ML model with you know, no I was training say, data, I, no data. I, I, like, have, <laughs> I have no, I have no idea what it would show. I have no, like, I was, really I think, I was like, what, what do people think they're going to see? You know? <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of thought just what you were explaining, which is a transparency in terms of here's how the ranking works. Here's how we weight certain posts, why we show you certain posts, what goes into the algorithm that makes you see something and not something else that makes us think that you're going to engage more with this particular piece of content and less with this particular piece of content. It does seem like that kind of transparency would be helpful. I'll be completely honest that I had no fucking idea what open source algorithm even means. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, is it a bunch of like numbers no, and code like, that I would um, just be like, uh, open source is a, there's a actually a fairly robust, you know, kind of dating back to the earliest days of the internet, um, you know, open source software movement where there's a belief that, um, you should, you know, you, you put your code up and other people can contribute to it. They can see it, they can audit it, they can make it better, they can find bugs. You know, GitHub really kind of uh, is a um, platform for this. And it's been core to and really foundational to the culture of the web for, you know, for decades. Um, the, I, you know, so, so that, so in the context of open source, it's kind of the idea that you're, you're going to like put it out and other people are going to get to audit it and engage with it and so on and so forth. Again, this question of algorithmic auditing, I think that, 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 makes complete sense provided, well, not necessarily the open sourcing, but the algorithmic auditing piece um, makes a lot of sense. It just requires like extraordinary technical capabilities <laughs> to do. And that's where, you know, um, again, some of the platform accountability and transparency um, work that we're starting to think about in the context of, um, you know, what is possible, what, what, would, uh, what would transparency enable? Um, yeah, there's questions around how do we maximize user privacy? How do we maximize, you know, maintaining um, trade secrets for platforms while also having some, uh, you know, independent third-party researchers looking at and, you know, kind of assessing uh, what's going on under the hood. It also seems like with just about everything else in politics these days that we're all sort of playing this game like it's on the level where we're going to have all this transparency about what's actually happening to give people uh, a better idea of, of what's going on, of algorithmic rankings and all that. And conservatives are just going to, or right wingers are just going to use that to point to something and be like, see, we were shadow banned, even if it doesn't make sense and it's not true. <laughs> Well, and that's because ultimately the the you know this is a um, a conversation that is part of the meta conversation about power, right? And 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 you know and and attention. And that was um, this uh, you know it, it's not that you're you know that I, I um I was kind of joking around about bringing stats to a meme fight on Twitter last night, um, <laughs> uh, but I but I think that that's actually you know to some extent what's happening. You're assuming that there's like. Uh, and Elon very well may be in the realm of the good faith people who want to know the truth and will, you know, adjust their beliefs and their commentary on it when they see what is actually happening. I think that's that you know that 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 used to be the the vision, right? We would have more facts and we would change our minds and we would say, okay, this was happening, this was not happening. Here's how we should think about, I, uh, you know, I was right, I was wrong, you know, etc. Um, that's not going to happen, I don't think. I, and you know, I people tell me that that's a very cynical belief, but um, but since there is such a um, political power component to the conversation, you may remember President Trump fundraising on the idea that his supporters were being shadow banned and or or uh, or censored. And one of the ways in which this manifested, and this I think is actually really interesting, other thing that maybe got memory hold if you weren't paying attention to content moderation conversations. Um, it happened because a tweet of his was labeled. 
not taken down, labeled. And there was a fact check that was appended to some false claim that he made. I don't remember the specifics right now, but um, but the label was contextualized by his inner circle on Twitter and other places as censorship. And I thought, wow, this is really something now. We've moved into the realm where contextualization, which you could argue is actually kind of counter speech in a way. It's just putting the other, you know, the other kind of point saying, eh, this isn't accurate, but we're letting it stand. Here it is. Nobody's taking it down. But here is the uh, here is a fact check on that point. And again, this question of design, right? You can let something stand, you can let it stay up, you can let that account be searchable, um, you know, findable, and you can, you know, en enable people to see its content. But you can also put up this this fact check. And yet, um, the fact check itself, the act of informing, the labeling, was processed and put out to the public to the supporters as an egregious act of censorship and then this led to this led to a web form uh, asking people to describe uh, a time you know the, the times that platforms had censored them um, and that of course you know this being the internet that turned into a bunch of people uploading like a bunch of uh you know photos you can imagine of what <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was that was you know that was kind of how it played out and platforms have for anyone who doesn't you know I, I um who for anyone who hasn't been immersed in content moderation you have remove reduce and inform right those are the sort of three buckets that's Facebook's terminology but roughly speaking that's what tech platforms have at their disposal remove it comes down reduce it's uh, algorithmically uh, downranked or deprecated uh, again you can go and search it and see it on someone's account but it's not going to be pushed into the feed, right? It's it's downranked a bit in the curation process. And then inform, which is the label goes up alongside it. And we just kind of reached a point largely through politically motivated conversation, the, the ability to use this as a real grievance, uh, again, where there's some instances of moderation that are overreach and bad and and shoddy and possibly biased. Again, we don't we don't really have that that data that that finding yet. But all aspects of moderation were rolled into this narrative of it is anti-free speech moderation is censorship and so any and all of the nuance that was possible in that conversation in that that how do we use design to build better communities to create healthy conversations really just became flattened down into um who has the right to decide what is healthy and who is the arbiter of truth and who watches the watchmen right and that was where uh that was where the conversation got kind of reduced to and that's um kind of where it's been stuck for you know for a while now well it, and it also feeds into trump and increasingly the right's sort of grievance based politics right if it there's plenty of fact checks on on uh, th that i might disagree with i would say I don't agree with that fact check. I think I was right and the fact check is wrong. I would not say that fact check is censorship. But if you say it's censorship, then you make people believe that they have somehow been um, suppressed or prejudiced against and you feed grievance and you feed anger. And so like, that's sort of what the right does very well. And so in some ways it's like, again, we're trying to play on the level here with these fact checks and you can disagree about facts, but they're 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 playing like you said it's it's all about power uh which is a, just a, a different different ball game um thinking about the bigger picture here i really liked and uh, and laughed at the opening of your atlantic piece where you wrote i didn't wake up this morning planning to write about twitter and i've never woken up with the intent to write about elon musk but this is the nature of twitter the spectacle sucks you in and that got me thinking like as someone who studies how misinformation and propaganda shape media and politics and democracy how much do you think it matters what ultimately happens to Twitter, which has always been a platform that's had outsized influence relative to its user base? I, I think you're um, you said the the P word, right? Propaganda, which is where this is a whole like other hour long conversation, I think. But um, I I that is that is how I think about it. And and I really feel like, you know, misinformation and disinformation, they're terms, they have value, they have meaning, but they have had extraordinary scope creep. And that is a problem, in my opinion. And so mis and disinformation became like a, you know, inexorably tied up in content moderation. I, I did start to feel like we were, you know, things that are propaganda, they are not falsifiable, right? It's not something, you know, we usually use disinformation to refer to a deliberate campaign to, um, you know, to mislead the public. 
um, oftentimes in the context of something like state actors or people who are not what they seem using inauthentic tactics, that, that's what disinformation should mean. That's what it you know, referred to in its kind of Cold War origin. Um, but propaganda has always been something else. And these are platforms that are really tailor made for propaganda. They're made to persuade. But more importantly, the, the um, you know, kind of the old media theory <laughs> view of propaganda as a tool for activation. Again, it is really all about activation. And that I think is, um, that is the value of Twitter. And in some of the work that we did on trying to understand election related um, narratives in 2020. So we did not pay attention to like candidate A lied about candidate B or this policy was not adequately truthfully represented. We were only interested in narratives around voter fraud right, and, and allegations of fraud, because I think that there also has to be a, a notion of harm, right? There's always going to be people who are wrong on the internet. There's always going to be propaganda. There's even always going to be disinformation. So what are the high harm areas that are worth moderating as opposed to allowing people to kind of fight it out amongst themselves? There's many different opinions on that. But in the work that we did, we scoped it towards election delegitimization. And what you start to see is this dynamic in which um, it is you know, people see something, they they feel uncertain about what they're seeing. I see a suitcase outside of this polling place and I am concerned. I have heard that there's gonna be massive fraud. So I process that suitcase as somebody, they are taking ballots away or moving ballots in, you know, as the case may be. Um, and, you know, everybody has a, a camera phone in their pocket. They take the photo, they tweet it, they tag in a couple of influencers in their sort of political sphere. They're aligned, you know, politically aligned people. Um, and then those people have massive followings oftentimes. And so they, they blast it out big if true. So again, there's no attempt to find out if it's true. No one knows if it's true or not, but you've just created an environment of suspicion. You've created, a, you know, a, uh, um, an accusation. And what happens on Twitter does not stay on Twitter. So this dynamic then makes it to Facebook where it's debated in those closed crowds. It makes it to YouTube where somebody makes a video looking at the photo and spending 30 minutes discussing like what may or may not be happening. Um, but then that video is pushed back out to Twitter, right? And so this is a this is an information environment. This is, a, this is a, a system. And so interestingly, the moderation and policies of one uh, platform do have impact across, you know, as it kind of cascades across the system. And so Twitter is important because of that amplification function, because people with very, very large followings are on it, because hyperpartisan media is on it, because mainstream media is on it with, you know, massive broadcast audiences. And that is this, this kind of interesting pivotal role that uh, that Twitter takes is if you make something trend, you know, you make it true. You people believe it, they see it, they engage with it, they amplify it, and so it's a really directly participatory platform in a way that very few things are. Not you know, you might leave a comment on YouTube, but not everybody is like engaging in quite the same way. TikTok in some ways is maybe a close second in that like duet function or people like it, you know, kind of like. Um, playing and building off of each other and that content in that kind of collaborative creation kind of model. Um, but Twitter is really distinct. People feel that this is the platform where they can speak to the powerful, to the media, they can bypass the gatekeepers. And so it really occupies um, a really kind of central place in our understanding of what it means to be a participatory citizen and, you know, in American politics today. Offline is brought to you by Fume. We talk about communication and connection a lot on this show. I know a few people that smoke or vape, and I'm sure you do too. How does that habit cut into your connection with that person? Mm -hmm. it bad. I don't like it's that. Bad. I don't like it. You don't like no. it. We know about the health risks, but if smoking has evolved from a casual habit to something taking over your life, you got to check out Fume. Check it out. Fume is a natural inhaler designed for a better, safer, and natural way to quit cigarettes. It's a no smoke, no vape, no nicotine replacement for the hand to mouth habit of smoking. For most people, quitting cold turkey doesn't work. So Fume handcrafted these wooden inhalers infused with plant oils studied to curb cravings. They have core flavors like peppermint with minty notes and lemon berry bliss for a sweeter experience. All of their flavors are 100% natural, no harmful chemicals, no artificial flavors, and no nicotine. They got thousands of five-star reviews from smokers who tried everything else until this worked for them. I mean, look, I got a, I got a lot of people in my life that I love that still smoke. It's disgusting. It's like guaranteed to kill you. Try, try fume. It. Give them a fume. See if it helps ease the cravings. 
Plus, the, the you know, your hair's not going to smell like smoke. Your clothes aren't going to smell like smoke. You're not going to have. Uh, you're, you're, it's going to help ease all the cravings. Maybe yeah, you're looking for an alternative to the down. patches or the pills or all that stuff. This is perfect. Use Fume. Whether you're a smoker or ex-smoker who still struggles with cravings, Fume is on a mission to help one million people quit smoking by 2025. Head to breathefume.com slash crooked and use promo code crooked to save 10% off your entire order. That's 10% off your entire order when you head to B-R-E-A-T-H-E-F-U-M dot com slash crooked and use the code crooked. Today's episode is sponsored in part by Seeker, a new independent search engine that prioritizes transparency, choice, and control, streamlining access to reliable information online. Just think, no more clickbait, no more hidden agendas, no more slanted search results favoring profits over people, no more spreading misinformation. With Seeker, you can finally start to feel good about what you read. Here's how it works. Powered by artificial intelligence, each new search result comes with its own Seeker score, a rating that determines how reliable an article is based on criteria like subjectivity, clickbait, incoherence, and title exaggeration. Again, Tommy setting that filter on incoherence. <laughs> well, it would be really funny to set your filter for maximum incoherence. <laughs> you just get yeah, like I don't, I don't want to understand news. a fucking thing that I'm reading. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm looking for online. You can, it's, it's basically Twitter. You yeah, can also filter your true. search results by political lean left, center, or right making it easier to get all sides of a story. I'm, I'm, of course, I'm, of course, filtering by center. No <laughs> labels. No before you click. Your no before solver. you click. You got to know before you click. Although, if you knew before you click, why are you clicking? You know? <laughs> the whole point is sure. maybe you don't know. Then maybe you won't click. That's why you click. Then maybe you don't click. To get started, visit seeker.com slash crooked so they know we sent you. That's S-E-E-K-R dot com slash crooked. Seek for yourself today because transparency matters. Offline is brought to you by Future. Future believes that people motivate people. Having your own future coach isn't just the best approach. It's the only sustainable approach to your health and fitness. Think about all the things that would be ridiculous to teach yourself or to be an expert on without a mentor, teacher, or coach. A blacksmith. Yeah, Are you working famously, on Glass famously, blowing. I mean, uh, remember, uh, remember what happened to Johnny Tremaine? I do. I think we all do. People don't talk about it. More and more, more people, more people, are, people talking are talking about, about Johnny Tremaine. What happened to Johnny Tremaine? His fingers got fused together because he, wasn't, he wasn't ready wasn't ready to work with that hot metal needed some more training here's the thing with future you're going to have your own coach your coach is going to tailor your plan to your goals and balance consistency and motivation to set you up for long-term sustainable success they'll be there to celebrate your achievements and give you an extra push when you need it and let me tell you every once in a while if i have not done my workout uh by a certain time every morning i get a little message from gabe and he's like hey man what what you up to you're gonna do the you're doing the workout today you busy you have, you have some time to uh, to hit the gym, and then I usually do it, and it works. Future isn't a fancy piece of equipment. This isn't a get-fit-quick plan. This isn't a YouTube video with daily coaching and tailored workout plans. Your future coach will support you through every step of your fitness journey. There's no risk to try Future, and right now you can get 50% off your first three months and cancel any time during the first 30 days at tryfuture.com slash crooked. That's tryfuture.com slash crooked. So I've seen people argue both the optimistic and pessimistic cases for what becomes of the platform if Elon closes the deal. I think that's really hard to predict, but just to do this here, what do you think the most pessimistic possibility might be? I think the most pessimistic um, outcome would be like a rollback to 2015. Um, that's sort of, uh, you know, does it turn back into um, harassment mobs and, uh, you know, really kind of Legal, lawful but awful like is there a proliferation of lawful but awful uh, which is what they've they've tried to to minimize at this point and on the optimistic side uh if elon were to call you tomorrow and ask for advice on what would actually improve the platform from where it is now or if the deal doesn't go through which is you know always possibility um what would you tell him or, or how, to, how how would you improve the platform from where it is now i think that I think that the transparency piece is really, really foundationally important, actually. I think that, um, you know, the same way there have been um, really great books written over the years explaining how the sausage is made in media, uh, I think the real opportunities to do that, to explain how it's made on, on social media platforms, just to, you know, um, we talk a lot about media literacy in the context of, you um, lateral reading or trusting a source or so on and so forth. It's more like, how do you process the media content that you get on social media, as opposed to a kind of a foundational understanding of um, in the broadest terms, here is how curation works. Here is how recommendations work. Here is how something trends. 
it is like an adversarial environment. You don't want to necessarily put out the full like, um, here's the weighting that you can manipulate if you want to have the greatest impact in the shortest amount of time, you know, to get your thing trending. Uh, but there is there is like, a, again, a, a pretty broad area, I think, where um, we can help people understand how this works. And then more importantly, for interrogating this question of is there disproportionate censorship, is there viewpoint based censorship, is moderation fairly applied, I, I do think that there's a lot of work that we can be doing on that front to get it out of the realm of like, you know, memes and vibes and bring it into the realm of actually understanding how these systems work, because they're so central to our lives at this point. It is not like a um, just a thing that some you know, extremely online people pay attention to. We've talked about the US in the, you know, in the last 45 minutes, we haven't even gotten to what happens in the rest of the world. You know, these are global platforms and, and they, the impact of them, the power that they have, the power to call attention, to activate is profound. And, and I do think that, you know, the transparency goal that Elon has is a good one. The maximization of freedom of expression is incredibly powerful, particularly in countries where the media is controlled by authoritarians and people don't have the right to go stand on their corner with a bullhorn, right? And so that is, um, there is, again, I, <laughs> I, am, I am not um, negative on the idea of improving Twitter to be a free speech maximizing platform. I just think that there is this nuance related to moderation that could better be incorporated into, you know, in, into the understanding of the problem. Yeah. And you don't always get that in the, uh, in the, you don't get fights. that on Twitter. It turns you don't out get that with, yeah, nobody wants the get, nuance. <laughs> that's, that's, you don't get that from vibes and memes. Last two questions. I'm asking all of our guests, what were you doing the last time you realized you needed to put your phone down and, uh, what's your favorite way to unplug? Oh, I have, um, I've got three kids. So eight, five and 18 months oh, wow. and the 18 month old will just come and take the phone. <laughs> She'll just pull it out of my hand, you know, <laughs> very unfiltered, like mommy, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's playtime now, <laughs> um, which is, I actually feel really guilty when she does that. I feel like I've like, you know, been immersed in the, um, I, I am one of these people. Twitter is my, is actually my preferred platform of choice. It's where I spend most of my time. I, I really do love it actually. And, um, I always learn something when I when I go on it or I meet someone interesting and uh, but I'm also one of these horrible people who like closes the app and then 30 seconds later like it's just the default so um I, I try to catch myself when I do that um how do I unplug I mean I again three kids I go camping I, uh, oh, I take nice. them out yeah 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 we really like camping and um I <laughs> think touch grass right <laughs> 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 um no I think the uh I, you know, I just like, um, I like being outside. I like walking around. I like, um, I just like, uh, like being with the kids. Um, I work a lot. And so it's nice to have that, that family time. Yeah, no, I have a, uh, I have a almost two year old, so I'm, I'm in the same boat. I'm in the same boat. Um, Renee DeResta, thank you so much. I could talk, talk for hours about all this stuff. Uh, and perhaps we will again soon. Um, but thank you so much for joining offline. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's great to chat. 